Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins, a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and sacred scriptures, along with information on topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Father Jim Corda. Wineskins is brought to you by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, I will interview Monsignor John Zura on the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. We will also look at the life of St. Damien of Molokai, as well as reflections on the readings for this sixth Sunday of Easter. That and more coming up on Wineskins. To tell us more about missions in the Diocese of Youngstown is Father Ed Brenz. The prophet Isaiah reminds us that all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. And the psalmist tells us that the Lord has revealed to the nations his saving power. One of the ways that the love of the Lord gets spread around the world is through the missions. The missions of the church are an important part of acquainting people with Jesus Christ and his message of mercy, salvation, and care for each other. Some of the missionaries that have gone around the world are quite inspiring for us, even in this day and age, and even in our home community. I'd like to share with you a few thoughts about Blessed Peter Turo, who was the first blessed martyr of Papua New Guinea. Inspired by his faith in Christ, he was a devoted husband, a loving father, and a dedicated catechist, known for his kindness, his gentleness, and his compassion. He witnessed to the gospel during very difficult situations when the village was occupied during a war and all the priests were imprisoned. And so he, as a father and a married man, became a spiritual leader for the people. Blessed Peter will always be remembered, especially by the people of New Guinea, for showing them the way and to keep the faith, especially when the rest of the world is closing in. Another good example of inspiration is St. Kateri Tekawitha, the Lily of the Mohawks. She lived a simple life and remained faithful to Jesus despite her persecutions. Her greatest wish was to know what to do that pleases God. And so she lived a life radiant with faith and purity. She impressed everyone by her actions and the grace that she showed even though she was pretty much alone in her faith among her own people. But she understood her vocation, and with courage she lived it. Her faith enriched the lives of so many other people. Today we see her as the protector of Canada and a strong Native American saint. We entrust to her the renewal of the faith in the First Nations and in all of the Americas. Likewise, St. Joseph Vaz, who was known as the Angelic Father, went to Sri Lanka. He ministered to the Catholic community, left behind his home, his family, and the comfort of familiar surroundings. But nonetheless, when God called, he went forth, and he spoke of Christ everywhere he was led. He offered the truth and the beauty of the gospel in a land where there were many different religions, all competing and yet he managed to respect everyone, their God-given dignity, and he showed true humility when others failed to do that. His example is still good for us today, and he continues to inspire the people of Sri Lanka and throughout all of Asia. We do well to notice his reverence for others and his desire to share with him that word of grace which has the power to build them up. A discussion of inspiring missionaries would be incomplete without St. Teresa of Calcutta. She was a generous dispenser of divine mercy, made herself available to everyone through the defense of human life, especially the unborn, and she looked after those who were abandoned and discarded. She bowed down before those who were spent, those who were left to die by the side of the road, seeing in them their God-given dignity. She also made the Lord's voice heard before the powers of this world, so that those in government 
could recognize their guilt for the crime of poverty that they created. Her mission to the peripheries, to the outskirts of society, is our model of holiness. She was seen as so tender and so near to everyone that we call her Mother Teresa. Although she was born in Albania, she was best known as that tireless worker of mercy in the slums of India. And so we invoke the saints, we look to them for examples, because we know that even in this day and age, the work of the gospel is not yet done. Let us bring it forward, let it be through our prayers and our outreach. For Wineskins, I'm Father Edward Brenz. This coming Thursday, the Church celebrates a feast of St. Damien of Molokai. To tell us more is Elena Chepke. She is from St. Joseph Church in Austintown. When Joseph de Vester was born, few people had any first-hand knowledge of leprosy. By the time he died at the age of 49, people all over the world knew of the disease because of him. This leper priest was born in Belgium in 1840 and 20 years later entered the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary. He took the name of a 4th century martyr and physician, St. Damien. He was ordained a priest in Honolulu in 1864, and for the next nine years, he worked in the missions on the Big Island, Hawaii. In 1973, he went to the missionary colony of lepers on the island of Molokai. There he remained permanently to care for the lepers' physical, medical, and spiritual needs. With his presence there, a vibrant settlement soon appeared with new houses, a new church, school, and orphanage. Morale improved significantly. A few years later, he was able to secure the services of the Franciscan Sisters of Syracuse, led by Mother Marianne Cope, who would later be canonized for her saintly work among the lepers there. In the year 1885, Damien announced that he was a leper and continued to build the local church and community on the island. He died three years later on Molokai. Some thought Damien a hero for going to Molokai. Others saw him as crazy to risk life and limb to minister there. To follow Christ, Damien not only left his homeland, but also staked his health so that he might receive life eternal. Damien's symbols are a tree and a dove. He is also the unofficial patron of those living with HIV and AIDS. For Wineskins, I'm Elena Chepke. Hello and welcome to Spotlight. I'm Father Jim Corda. During this series, we're going to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. And joining me in today's show is Monsignor John Zura. Welcome to Spotlight. Thank you very much. We know that you were very instrumental as uh, the chairperson of the committee that really looked into the celebration of the 75th anniversary. And in your experience over these last several months in preparation for this significant milestone in the life of the church, what have you discovered significant about anniversaries? Basically, I think the theme that we have selected, pride in the past, faith in the future, really articulates what we're going to be about during this 75th year. We look at the past and once again, we educate ourselves as to the various histories of our diocese, the individuals that have truly come together to truly make us the body of Christ in this local church. But it's more important that we begin to look at the future, that we begin to envision what the future of our diocese is going to look like as we move towards the 100th. For the 100th, I'm gonna be 83 years old, so, who knows where I will be at that point. I won't tell point. you how old I will be. So <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning. We know that the diocese was formed in 1943, mm -hmm. and we have Cleveland as our parent diocese. Talk a little bit about how that process happens and why the new diocese was formed here in Youngstown. In 1943, when the diocese was established on May the 15th, 
we had about 150,000 Catholics with about 89 parishes. So there was a need for a new diocese to be established. And through the leadership of Bishop McFadden and Bishop Walsh and Bishop Malone, the church really grew in our geographical area. Bishop McFadden had the vision and the organizational skills to establish a new diocese. Then it was Bishop Walsh who was the great builder of the diocese with various schools and various parishes. Then the implementation of the Second Vatican Council was the task of Bishop Malone. And Bishop Tobin and now Bishop Murray carry on the work of their predecessors. Let's talk a little bit about the people who make up the diocese and how important it is to remember that we are the church. It's just not the Pope and the Bishop and the priests and the nuns, mm -hmm. but we make up the body of Christ. How important is it for the whole diocesan church to celebrate significant milestones in the life of the church? I had an opportunity once again to read our mission statement. And our mission statement for the diocese basically centers on the rich background of who we are, that we are not the same individuals. We are not this of same culture. We're not of the same race, but we're a very diverse group. And the church is a very diverse group. And it is through the blood, sweat, and tears of our ancestors that we are able to celebrate 75 years. Those are the individuals who dedicated time and talent and treasures to build these magnificent edifices that we worship in today. So we look back and very much pride as to you know, what they accomplished. And, you know, now it is our responsibility to carry the future. I think one of the great events during this anniversary year is that our young people that are preparing for the Sacrament of Confirmation come together to not only celebrate the sacrament, but to experience a day of retreat. Mm -hmm. That, you know, how are they going to carry on the legacy? And during that day of retreat, they're gonna have an opportunity to learn a little bit about the diocese, what its origin and who makes up the diocese, but more importantly, how do we carry on for the future who we are as the body of Christ. A little later on in the show, we'll talk about some of the specifics that are really taking place in our diocese during this whole anniversary year. And then the middle segment, we are actually gonna show the history of the diocese video, but let's go back to Bishop Malone. He was the bishop that ordained you and ordained me. <laughs> in these last few minutes of our time together in the first segment, what has been your experience and remembrance and memories of Bishop Malone? I think Bishop Malone was a very forthright individual. You knew that he was the boss. And because you knew that, there was a sense of security that the church was going to be all right. He had a great flavor for the various churches around us. I remember the evening before his funeral, how the believing community of Youngstown came together to celebrate his life. It was just not the Catholic presence, but it was the Methodist, it was the Baptist, it was the various evangelical churches that truly celebrate a man of vision. And, you know, that's one of the great things that, you know, I remember about Bishop Malone, that he truly had a vision for the church. And that vision now is being brought forth mm -hmm. as we celebrate the 75th. In the 30 plus years that you have been a priest and in the almost 40 years that I've been a priest, we have seen many things become different and change. And the only constant really in the life of any institution is change. Mm -hmm. And so change needs to be our friend. And in your experience, how can we as a church make the changes that have happened over these many years personal experiences for us that are significant for the future of our church? We have an ability to be very creative. 
within the Diocese of Youngstown now, we have parish leaders. And the parish leaders invite us to move on as church. That individual buildings are not closing, but rather there are buildings that still have life and vitality amongst the people of God. And with this creativity, we have an opportunity to bring forth a vision of church that is unique to the Diocese of Youngstown, that is unique to our own specific being. You know, that faith in the future that we're celebrating also, not only the past, but there is a future for the Diocese of Youngstown. For more information on that current issue and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www. Dot doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. On May 13th, the World Apostolate of Fatima, Warren and Youngstown Byzantine Division, is blessing and commissioning the traveling pilgrim virgin icon of Our Lady of Fatima. The blessing will take place at Holy Trinity Byzantine Church on West Rayan Avenue in Youngstown, beginning at 10 a.m. with the rosary and procession. Mass will be celebrated at 11 a.m. Private veneration will be from 1 to 3 in the afternoon. For more information, contact Catherine Moran at 330-647-3833. Again, that is May 13th at Holy Trinity Byzantine Catholic Church in Youngstown. Call Catherine Moran at 330-647-3833 for more information. It was in Dungannon, Ohio, in Columbiana County, that one of the first group of Catholics settled. St. Philip Neri, the first parish in all northern Ohio, was founded in 1817 under the title of St. Paul's Settlement. It was to visit this settlement that Father Edward Fenwick, the Apostle of Ohio, made his first trip to northern Ohio. Four years later, Cincinnati was chosen as a sea city in the state of Ohio, and Fenwick was selected as the first bishop. Today, St. Philip Neri remains the oldest parish in the Diocese of Youngstown, but it is also one of the smallest. Congratulations, Catholic Diocese, for celebrating 75 years with pride in the past and faith in the future. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. The song we have for you today is from the CD called Love Road. It is by Tim Burke. Should ever find another heart 
to take the time to share the dreams that I might find through you. And if the Lord of my life should ever find another heart and we combine, from the start we should keep in mind the truth. Keep in mind the truth. And to tell us about the scriptures for this sixth Sunday of Easter is Deacon Mike Kajancic. He is from St. Charles Church in Boardman. If you were not paying attention to the readings, then you have no clue as to what the theme of today is. It's mentioned nine times in the first letter of John and eight times in the Gospel. The theme is mentioned 317 times in the Old Testament and 221 in the New. It's been the theme of at least 50 million songs, it's been in countless poems, novels, movies, TV shows, and so on. It is a many splendor thing, according to William Shakespeare. Johnny Mathis said it makes the world go round, while John Lennon told us it is all we need. With all these clues, you're probably guessing that I'm talking about love. And you'd be wrong. What we think of love is not the love as found in Scripture. We are so free in our use of the word love. I love the Browns. I love the movie King Kong listening to Adele, watching The Big Bang Theory, I love eating spaghetti. But none of these love me back. I mean really love. When we use the word that way, it's an internal response to an external stimulus. It's one-sided, all sentimental and emotional. That's not the love Jesus is talking about when he says to remain in his love and to love his Father with our very being and to love our neighbor. Love today is not what the culture of that time of Jesus meant by love. It was more than just a mere sense of feeling or emotion. It went beyond that. It was much deeper. It meant to stay attached forever. To stay where one is, never to stir from that spot no matter what. It's always there, in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. That is the love God has for us. God will never leave us no matter what happens to us in good times and bad, when we're sick and when we're healthy. This love is not a type of emotion, but it's an attitude. It's to live out the consequence of a choice, a deliberate act of the will. This is the type of love we are to live. 
With this type of love, you do not fall in love. This love is offered, and we must choose to accept this greatest gift from God, to be in love with God. But be aware, it is a dangerous love. If we live this type of love, the same love that Jesus had for his Father and for all people, we are told to lay down our lives for the other. And that is difficult. What exactly does that entail on our part? While we may not change feelings towards certain things or other objects or people, we have to learn how to control ourselves, how to act and react. Look at incidents of what happens when one cannot or does not want to control their emotions and rage. We're told to lay down our lives, lay down the prejudices, the personal and cultural preferences, our hatred, our suspicions, our mistrust. It is a moving from the me generation to the we generation. Is this type of love difficult? Is it dangerous? Definitely. But this type of love is also surprising, affirming, and life-giving. All we have to do is look at the life of St. Peter the Apostle. How dangerous it must have been for him to spread the good news beyond the Hebrew people. But then he realized how enriching this type of love was to his own faith his own belief to encounter such strong faith in an outsider like the Gentile Cornelius was a turning point in his life. The biggest surprise of all, there is enough love for all of us. If we think about it, we ourselves don't deserve to receive from others this type of love. But this is exactly the type of love God gives us, that no matter who we are or what we do, God loves us. Maybe John Lennon is right. Love is all you need, if it is the right type of love, the love that reflects the love God has for us. For Wineskins, I'm Deacon Mike Kajancic. We can learn all we need to learn about unconditional love from Jesus. Furthermore, it is in loving the way that Jesus loved that we know what love is all about. The question is, how do you show your love for Jesus? Wineskins is made possible through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. The program is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda, saying thank you for being with us. Have a blessed week.